Welcome to this live cast on our future economies. Capitalism, despite the tremendous increase in worldwide welfare through its innovative power and freedom, has at the same time a number of negative consequences. A transition is necessary to overcome ecological destruction, decrease in quality of life and growing inequality. Given geopolitical developments, Europe has an important role to play in this transition. In the live casts, we will start an open dialogue and discuss this transition with internationally renowned economists from all over the world. Questions will pass by, such as Each week, we will discuss these matters with two economists resulting in 10 online dialogues in 10 weeks, where we will share viewpoints and collect ideas on how capitalism's innovative and creative powers can go hand in hand with fostering an equal and just society. A different subject every week. Together we can build a basis for economies that are beneficial to all of us. You can participate by putting your questions and remarks in the chat. So, let's talk. Thank you, Natasha. And thank you as well, Professor Anderson, for being here with us tonight. Um, first off, the title of tonight is um, Free Markets and Inequality, an Inescapable Marriage. Do you agree with that? I wanted to comment on the concept of free markets. Uh, it's widely misunderstood. Every market requires extensive regulations, even to get off the ground. <clears throat> There are constitutive uh, uh, features of markets, rules of the game by which people have to play. Some of these are set by the state, but usually in any market, there's considerably additional uh, regulations that determine the rules of the game. Often when people speak of free markets, what they want is the states to minimize regulation but in practice, what that means is the power to construct the additional rules that govern that market is handed over to the most powerful economic agent. And that I find fundamentally problematic because that agent invariably write the rules of exchange in its own interests and at the expense of counterparties. So that's a fundamental disagreement I have, is that there, there have to be lots of regulations in any market. And the question is, who is going to make those regulations? Will it be the state, which in a democratic order is accountable to the people? Or will it be the most powerful actors, economic actors, those with the most wealth or perhaps a monopoly position who exercise market power? Um, in order to constitute markets justly, I think we need a robust role for the state to set the rules of the game fairly, and also to think very seriously about market power and regulations needed to minimize market power, for instance, through antitrust regulation. Yeah. Thank you very much. Very interesting question. I think we'll come back to that later in the discussion uh, tonight. Looking forward to uh, moving into more depth about that as well. Uh, Ms. Anderson, just to set the scene for tonight a little bit more, uh, in your book, uh, Private Government, How Employers Rule Our Lives, you mentioned that firms are political in a sense. What do you mean by that? Well, government exists whenever you have some people in a position to give orders to other people that they disobey on pain of some sanction. And on that very capacious notion of government, then every firm is a government because you have managers giving orders to workers and the workers could be punished by being fired or demoted uh, or harassed in various ways if they don't follow those orders. So then if we ask, well, what is the typical constitution of the government of the firm, at least in United States, the constitution of the firm is fundamentally a dictatorship or maybe an oligarchy in which those, the governed, that is the workers have no power. 
So they're, they don't have any rights of participation in that government, even though they're ruled by it. Uh, uh, and, and that's really the source of domination within the workplace uh, uh, in a formation that I call private government. So in your book, for example, you use Ronald Coase's theory of the firm, for example, and you research, you illustrate that firms are kind of small command centers, command economies where contracts intentionally, for example, leave uh, vague the exact duties of, of work. Um, and you seem to imply that this vagueness is not accidental because it almost always seems to benefit the employer. Um, how does this vagueness, for example, in these contracts benefit the employer or the upper party. I just want to stress that any well-run organization is going to have to leave a lot of room for discretion in order to get its business done. So uh, you can't have a completely minutely specified contract that's really efficient for productive purposes because there's always unanticipated circumstances you're going to have to rally workers around to solve problems that weren't already anticipated and written into the contract. The difficulty is that at least in the American uh, context, uh, the terms of the employment contract are so open-ended that they give power to employers to regulate uh, workers' lives in ways that really have no efficiency rationale whatsoever. Or if it has an efficiency rationale, employers have the right to regulate workers' lives that severely impair other essential freedoms, the right to privacy and so forth. Uh, uh, that it's important to protect uh, both on duty and off duty. But in the U.S. context, a worker could be fired for, for instance, uh, taking a political position off duty uh, or endorsing a candidate that the boss doesn't like. There are no protections against that. So you could be fired for your off duty behavior or off duty recreation behavior, uh, choice of marriage and sexual partners. All kinds of things that uh, that workers take for granted that they ought to be able to do without the scrutiny or sanction of their employer could lead to job loss in in the American context. So we have an open on kind of power that bosses have over their workers in innumerable cases in which they've exercised that power, even though there's not even a remote hint of economic rationale for it. Mm. Isn't this um, an extreme example, or is this more common than we tend to think it is? In fact, it's extremely common. So a very large percentage of American workers are subject to suspicionless drug testing. Uh, They have every word monitored, every keystroke monitored, even when they're on breaks. Uh, they can have their phone conversations with their family monitored if it takes place within the office. We see a regime of comprehensive surveillance and minute control of innumerable workers uh, at work. And this is not; these are not isolated. We're talking about large percentages of American workers are subject uh, uh, to this kind of regulation. So many workers actually lead lives of quiet desperation, coerced by their lack of bargaining power and some harsh or perhaps sadistic bosses? Oh, absolutely. For instance, let's just take the example of sexual harassment. Uh, almost all... <laughs> Workers who suffer sexual harassment keep their silence. Why? Because there's no possibility of getting any justice within the system. If they, in fact, the vast majority of harassment lawsuits that are filed in the United States are actually for retaliation rather than for the original harassment uh, uh, because they get fired if they complain. Well, <laughs> it's known to workers that they'll get fired if they complain about conditions. So no wonder conditions are awful. And it's not just sexual harassment. There's all kinds of goes on at the workplace and there's no regulations against that as long as the boss isn't discriminating in, 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 in the bullying behavior it can go on and there's no workers have no recourse under the law at all for that yeah so what can we do to make uh, make sure that market relations become more voluntary or more equal so to speak well 
I do think that here's a place where the United States could learn something from uh, some European practices. I think that we have to reform the constitution of the government of the workplace and, and elements of democracy. Uh, and it's high time, for instance, the United States started experimenting seriously with models of co-determination, which were pioneered in Germany. Uh, and we also need to strengthen labor unions, which are the fundamental basis which workers can complain about work conditions uh, uh, and still have protection from getting fired for the mere act of complaining. So are any of these ideas, because as you mentioned, they are um, very embedded within the American context, are some of the ideas you mentioned applicable to the European context as well? Or uh, is it just possible that you could learn from the European context and there's nothing <laughs> well, wrong with that? <laughs> one of the phenomena that we see across many capitalist countries is the rise of uh, precarity. So our temporary workers, zero hours contract workers, and, and these people are incredibly vulnerable. <laughs> So even the minutest kind of unsatisfactory behavior from the manager's point of view could lead to job loss or not enough hours to support oneself. Uh, uh, and, and, and so that also, I think, makes many workers in Europe as well as the United States uh, vulnerable to arbitrary uh, and abusive treatment by their employers because they have such a continuous connection uh, uh, to the uh, to the party who's uh, directing their labor yeah so we started off this interview um, by asking the question is it an inescapable marriage free markets and inequality and um, I'd like to ask you as a closing question Ms. Professor Anderson um, is this idea of um, this coercion in work how should we regulate that how should we how should we build, uh, for example, regulation around that? Should it be coming from within firms themselves or from governments, politicians, and who are going to, who is going to do that? I think we have to design the constitution of the government of the firm to empower workers to have a voice in management. And that's critical. So what I would say is there is, it isn't inevitable. There's not an inevitable marriage between markets and inequality, but you have to get the regulations right. And you have to have regulations that empower the parties who in the current system are relatively weaker. And you have to have regulations that break up concentrations of power, such as we see, for instance, in technology where we have companies that completely dominate high tech, right? There has to be antitrust. Thank you, Professor Anderson. Thank you for your answers. We'll come back to that. Looking forward to the discussion later on in this evening.